Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later, we'll uh, profile ceramic artist Brad Bachmeyer. Uh, but first, we have a guest with us, Teresa Jones. Teresa, thanks for joining us today. Mm -hmm. You are uh, an author of a new book uh, out yes. as uh, My Vladislaus Dracula. Yes, Vladislaus Dracula. Vladislaus Dracula. <laughs> I, I said I'd get close to it. <laughs> First off, tell, okay. tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background. Okay, I was born and raised in Iowa, in Arnold's Park, Iowa. I went to school in um, Okaboji and um, graduated, graduated from, we had a choice to have our diplomas. We were the last of our class to have our diplomas either say Okaboji or Arnold's Park because they were combining. And um, I, I got married, uh, went into the military. Um, I met my husband in the military, and I decided to come back, and and uh, I stayed in Lake Park, Iowa now for the last 15 years. And so um, being there, I, um, I have two children, um, my son, Nicholas, and my daughter, Cynthia, and they both go to Lake Park Public School, so. Okay. Now, how did you come to be an author? Well, my husband went over to Iraq. And when he was over there, um, I used to write four or five page letters to him because I wanted him to know everything that was going on in our lives at the time. And so, you know, he couldn't read them, obviously. He said he, he would print them out and read them later. But of course, they kept coming. And so he had stacks and stacks. And when he came home, I was kind of void. I was like, wait a minute. I loved that writing and telling him stories of what happened. And so, you know, we had gone on a vacation when he came back to Hawaii. And at that point in time, while I was finally able to relax, I started dreaming and and just my mind was filling with all of these, you know, mm -hmm. just all of these books that I, stories, and so I ended up with about 14 of them to begin with. And then when I, I tried to take one at a time, and I started with, of course, An Escape a Secret Life because we were in um, Hawaii at the time. And so, and that's how I had started my uh, writing, of course. Okay. Well, then let's start with this one because we're going to get okay. to others. But tell us about this book here. Okay. Obviously an interesting subject. To be yes, sure. yeah, it's an interesting subject because a lot of people do not distinguish, you know, the vampire Dracula from Bram Stoker's and then the 15th century Romanian prince of, Roma of you know, Romania. And so um, uh, what a lot of people, you know, end up doing is they combine the two, which they shouldn't because they're two separate. Because of, of obviously Bram Stoker, mm -hmm. you know, um, if you go to... Uh, the Rosenbach, I believe it's the Rosenbach Museum in Philadelphia, you can find some notes on Stoker's book. And he was originally going to call his, his book Count Vampire. Of course, you know, the German W's, and, you know, they have a lot of problem with the V's, you know, like, wah. And so, and so he was really going to call it, you know, Count Vampire. And if he would have done that, it would have changed everything from, you know, a hundred and some years ago. Well, I think it was in 1890 he wrote his book, but... But yeah, it was a hundred and some years ago, and it would have changed our whole view on, you know, having some kid with, you know, fangs come to our door and say, oh, it's Dracula, you know. And so um, I had to, I had to write this book in order to, you know, dispel everything that Bram Stoker had done because, you know, the Romanian people really believed that this man was a hero. You know, he fought the Ottoman Turks. He he, you know, the Ottoman Turks enslaved his people. He freed them. And when a lot of people end up, you know, saying that the, he was a cruel tyrant, he was, you know, he, he did a lot of bad things and he impaled all these people. You can't believe everything that you hear, you know, because a lot of those things were made up pretty much to bring out the whole vampire aspect of him, uh, you know, of Bram Stoker's mm -hmm. book. So... Well, and so, yeah, you say this is a novel, mm -hmm. but uh, you're trying to debunk some of the myths, as, right, as you say. Right. But, uh, so how much is fact and how much is fiction? Well, I, I tried to get as much, you know, you take... Mm -hmm. You take fictional liberties, you know, to make it an interesting story. But, you know, what, what, what Bram Stoker did was what he tried to accomplish is he tried to bring, you know, the Dracula up to his time, you know, of the 19 or 1890s, you know. Well, I wanted to do the same thing by bringing, you know, Vlad Dracula up to the 21st century. And so by doing that, you have to take some fictional liberties with history. And, but I have tried 
what I've tried to do with Amelia is I wanted her to talk about his history, to make sure that people knew, you know, that this man did good things. He, you know, he may have tried to turn around his country because his country was completely without laws, without, you know, a, a system of government because there were the boyers who always tried to take over. And of course, when you don't have, when you have kings who are killing each other, you have these people in the background called the boyers, you know, that, that's what they call them over in Romania, who, who were the treasurers, who were the people who kept the, the money. And so what happens with these people is that they, <laughs> they take little by little so that the kings in, don't know. And so when you get these, you know, these kings that are passing, they don't know what the next king had or hadn't because the boyers could do whatever they wanted. And so he, Vlad Dracula was the first one to get rid of all of them. He got rid of all of his government and he started from new. And I know a lot of people say that that's what we need to do now. <laughs> but he did it. He was capable of doing it and he did it. Granted, it was harsh, mm -hmm. but there were, there was a Spanish Inquisition going around at the time, and you tell me that he was worse than that? No, I mean that was comp he did not kill because of of um, I wanted to say religious reasons, but be but because of the Turks were trying to take over his land. They were taking over his land, and they were taking his children. You know, the children of Wallachia. That's you know the country he ruled over. And so all he did was try to say, I want to be independent. That was, that was pretty much it. And to be independent, I'm not going to give you your tributes. I'm not going to let you take my children. And I'm going to, you know, try to r rule my land with, you know, with courage, conviction, and I want to have respect. And to do that, he had to do a lot of, you know, bad mm -hmm. things. But we, we consider them bad. But at that point in time, you know, when you have someone who steals something and then you impale them, it really wasn't, you know, considered that bad. It was, that was just what was happening. So, so was he misunderstood or, or, or sort of misportrayed in books and movies? Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. Yeah. You know, be, Bram Stoker's book is great. You know, he was a man that just had a vision and and he came up with it. And, and in the 1890s, you know, you know, and, and so it was it was it was a fantastic book. But because he did that, you know, then he, um, you know, dispels everything that that Dracula stood for. If you if you don't try to separate the two, you know, if mm -hmm. you believe that, you know, Dra uh, Vlad Dracula was a vampire, then, you know, you haven't read any documentation on the man, so. Okay. Well, speaking of that, uh, mm -hmm. can you talk some about the research you did for the book? Because I oh, believe yeah. you even traveled abroad. Yes, I had to, well, I started mm -hmm. writing it first, and then I had to go to Romania to find out, because a lot of things on the internet you cannot find, you know, the documents that are in, you know, Brasov and, and Sibiu museums, you know, you can't find those on the internet. And so what you have to do is you have to go over there and you have to look for yourself what's really true and what's false. And, you know, sometimes on the Internet you see this, oh, he went from Turgovice to, to you know, Sibiu within a matter of, you know, a day. I'm like, wait a minute. We drove that and it almost took us, you know, a day. How could he have done that? You know, so when you hear that, you don't think anything of it because you don't know the map, you don't know the terrain. But, I mean, the Carpathian Mountains, Car Carpathian Mountains, they're absolutely phenomenal and the beautiful countryside and so you you have to really go over there and see you know what's um, the, the terrain and what he actually had to live in and a, a lot of it hasn't really changed <laughs> it's beautiful it's like stepping back in time that's what I said it was just I had to go over there and see and like I said the museums are where you want to go to find his documents and when he wrote these documents and he said you know, these these things like your brother in arms and for our God, we need to do this and we must not back down. And he asked for help and and, you know, for people to back him up. And and so you, this coming from a monster, but, you know, I just I had to go over to Romania to find out for myself. And I did find the answers that I, I needed. But I want to go back. <laughs> <laughs> well, did you actually visit and I know I'm get in trouble here. Mm -hmm. Castle Dracula. Okay. See, a lot of people <laughs> think Castle Dracula is Bran Castle. But, see, Bran is right outside of Brasov. Okay, they call it Brasov. But it, it's right outside of Brasov where he supposedly impaled 30,000 people. Now, if you go over to Romania and you go to the, the city uh, archives in um, Brasov, you will find that they state that he only impaled 40 people. 
I'm like, how did that happen? And then a friend of mine, Dealey, said, well, how could he impale 30,000? There was only a probably nine to 10,000 population there at the time. And I'm like, that was why, one of the reasons I had to write this. His, the things that they had hyped up to try to imprison him, you know, was, was one of the things that I wanted to, you know, dispel that I wanted to show people. You cannot believe all these bad things, you know? And, and so, you know, a quarter, but Castle Dracula, and back to your question, mm -hmm. <laughs> is, is actually in Poenari, which is a little bit, um, I'm going down the map here, but it, it's, it's in the Argish Valley, and it is so beautiful. I mean, we had to hike 1,500 steps up there, but that is his castle. That's the one he had the Boyer slave labor, slave, la slave labor on Easter dinner, where he supposedly, you know, captured and paled 500 of them. Well, if you've been to Turgovice, I have to say this, you've been to Turgovice Castle, you could probably get maybe, you know, maybe a maximum of 120 people in there. You know what I mean? Mm. You couldn't get five. So all of these things that you hear on the internet, but you, you don't even want to believe those. But Castle Dracula is Poenari, and he didn't even go, he didn't even, probably even step foot in Bran Castle. And that's what they're usually calling, you know, Castle Dracula. So you, you got to get the tourist traps out of the way. That's what they do. Were you always fascinated by the Dracula legend <laughs> growing up? Or well, just something you acquired? Um, well, um, <laughs> I, I have. Well, it first started out that, you know, when you're a kid and you're watching those vampire movies and you're wondering, you know, what makes you want to watch those vampire movies so much? And I found that it was the that it was the fact that there there was a connection. You know, in every vampire movie that you see, you see Dracula as the main character hunting down the woman of, uh, that he knew in his past. And that's kind of where I started mine, uh, my book also. But um, the fact is that, you know, when you see these connections, you know, that they have such a strong connection. And whether it's, you know, uh, it, it's a blood connection or a, a f you know, a physical connection, they just cannot be without each other, you know. And so I think that's why there's so much romance out there with these Twilight. Because, you know, you got all of this, you know, out there that, oh, they have to be together. And, you know, it's it's the romance aspect of it that, that really kind of got me into the whole Dracula, mm -hmm. or vampire things. But then I was, that's... Then I was curious about, well, why do they call it Dracula? And so when I started punching that in, that's what made me get into want to write this book. Because as I looked up more information about Dracula, I was like, wait a minute. He was a 15th century Romanian prince? I had to know more and how he, you know, got to be a vampire. And what was the transition in Bram Stoker's novel and so on. Well, you mentioned Stoker's novel. Uh, mm -hmm. What's your opinion of that? Well, I, like I said, I think he's a brilliant man. You know, he, he obviously was a man of his times to come up with such such a deal as that, you know. But uh, but as far as, um, you know, the novel, I've never read his novel, but I've seen a lot of the movies after his novel. <laughs> and so I haven't really sat down and read his, his novel. But, you know, I, like I said, that over in the Rosenbach Museum in Philadelphia, you can find a lot of notes for him. And, and this is you know what some people on the internet are fighting about you know there's some people on this side that say you know no he never even intended to use Dracula as the name he, it's not about the 15th century Rom Romanian prince and then you have these other people on this side who say oh yes it is because all of these things fit in line well the way they fit in line is because you want them to fit in line you know it's not because it does you know and so on the, this side then they say you know the only way he knew about it was from William Wilkinson's book, you know, The Principalities of Wallachia and Moldavia, when there's only like two sentences that says Dracula's name. And then that's it. And so if, if Bram Stoker in his notes are completely factual, then, you know, the only way he knew about Dracula is from that book with only two sentences. The rest of it is obviously his imagination that just so happened to fit in. But I was told he has never... Bram Stoker never went to Romania, didn't even set foot on it. So, you know, so he knew about, and I was told that he knew about the layout of the land, you know, the Borgo Pass and everything like that, from um, his brother who had traveled in the military. So, you know, you get those kind of things. Your family tells you stories, and then your imagination mm -hmm. going, he could have had one that, like that. So, Well, let's take a break from this book for okay. a moment to... Talk about a couple of your other books okay. briefly. Can you talk about uh, a prelude to Christmas Carol? Okay. Uh, you know, the ghost of Christmas. Yes, prelude to a Christmas Carol. 
Um, I I wrote over 2000, 2009 and 2010, actually. I, I finished it, or 2008, 2009, um, and I finished it just in January of 2009 and had it published in February. And, and so that is set 20 years prior to Ebenezer's Night of Redemption. Now, I go back the 20 years to find out how did Ebenezer get the way he did? Why? Who was all involved in his life? You know, Fan obviously had a, a husband. So I started with the brother-in-law of Ebenezer Scrooge. So, okay. and um, it is it is now, can I talk about that now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, it is, I, I wrote the script for it. Okay. And, and um, the script was picked up by Lakes Community Theater and um, they're gonna be performing it December 3rd, 4th, 5th, 10th, and 11th this year, this December, which is so phenomenally fast, and is at the Pearson Lakes Art Center in Okaboji, Iowa. And so that is gonna be, I got my hands in it. I, you know, I'm, we're casting, we're casting on Monday the 20th and Monday the 27th of this month. And so we need 24 characters. And it's going to be a big cast, and it's going to be phenomenal. I just, I just can't wait till that comes out. You need to get more excited about it. I know. <laughs> but that's, you you got to need. There's another decap. book. Another book here. Uh, Escape: A Secret Life. You mentioned being in Hawaii. Yes, that was in Hawaii. That was my first book, and that was, of course, I when I was laying on the beach in Hawaii. Of course, a third of the book is absolutely true. A lot of people say, "Oh, this couldn't have happened." And I'm like, "Yeah, okay." But it, my mom and I had sit down and said, she thinks it's like um, uh, two thirds true. And I said, no, I think I'll give it a third true. But th it has a whole bunch of, um, you know, Hawaiian scenes, islands, kind of mystery to it of what happens, why, you know, they end up one place and at one time and why the next. And so that one was my first one, which I wrote in the first per person, which I had to because I was like, I wanted to be right there. You know, telling the story. So, yeah. Well, now I also understand that you're working on a sequel. Yes, I am. To your Dracula book. I'm about 62 pages. Okay, so tell us a little. <laughs> 62 pages. Well, like, it depends it. on how big your pages okay, well, are. Well, it's going to be just as thick because I just those are pretty much notes and outlines okay. and okay. and history because I wanted to make sure he lives on. So. Uh, well, they, they, he comes yeah. back to life in I know. other books and movies. So. I, but the way he comes back to life in this one is not like what people think he comes back okay. to life as. He's He's different. If you, yeah, you've read it, right? I've read part of it. Uh -oh. I've not read it. I've got it now, though. See, well, I'm <laughs> now, tell us about a uh, children's book you're working on. The early squirrels. Early squirrels. I know. I well, we had all of these squirrels that were running around our yard, and I have been working that since day one. Remember when I told you about the 14 books? Mm -hmm. That's one on my screen. That's above the 14 that I've been working on, and um, our neighbors, some. Our neighbors moved out and other people moved in. They had cats. And then all my squirrels disappeared. So I'm kind of like stuck right now, not writing it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I gotta okay. wait until the squirrels come back. There are, it's about two twin squirrels. And I'm sorry to say, but I don't have them anymore because something happened to them. Oh, okay. <laughs> I gotta get my, you know, <laughs> my imagination back because they're not there anymore. Writer's so, block. Okay. Yeah, it's right outside my window. That's where I write, so. Uh, there's a movie there somewhere. <laughs> uh, what's your advice for young writers out there? I'm going to tell young writers that, you know what, when somebody tells you you can't do something, because a lot of people told me that, why are you writing a script for Prelude? You're never going to be able to see it. And I said, oh my gosh, guess what? I wrote it in 60, I wrote the script in 16 days. I was Twittering about it, you know, and they kept saying, oh, you're not. And, and then all of a sudden I said, don't tell me I can't, because then I'm going to try harder to can. And so I, I always tell everybody that you, you get your imagination going, you can write whatever you want. And that's what makes, you know, everybody, they want to, to you know, voice their opinion. Everybody <laughs> wants to voice it, especially young people. The best way to do it is you go write. You write it all out, whatever you want. I don't care if aliens come to this planet and want to take you away and you're going to have a better world. Guess what? That's what Avatar was. And so you, your imagination is limitless when you write. And you can step into this world as much as you want, as long as you come back out when you're done. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, so what makes a good writer? I think imagination. The best is imagination, and it's the limit. You want to you wanna do a murder mystery? Oh, my gosh. You know, look at all the movies out there. Some of them are kind of crappy right now. You can do anything you want. And so, you know, 
Um, I the <laughs> that Vampire Sucks movie. <laughs> you know, look at that. <laughs> you can do better than that. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, let's talk about a little bit about your writing because you've got a wide variety of subject matter yes, in your books. Yes. Uh, was that your aim when you started out? Or no, you... no, no. I like I said, those fourteen. Yeah. You know, uh, I have uh, the fourteen icons on my screen of each different book that I wanted mm -hmm. to start writing on, and I just kind of picked one, and then when it took off, I stayed with it. And then I had, I'm one of those people who have to finish. You know, I, I have to finish this. I can't move on until this is done. You know, I don't care if I need to do the dishes first and then go on to, you know, the floor. Don't tell me I need to clean the floor first. I have to stay on the dishes. So that's exactly the way I did with the books. I had to finish writing this one once I started it. And, and so with Early Squirrels, the only reason I lost it is because you know, okay. the two squirrels kind of got smushed on the road. <laughs> what, so, so, so how has uh, this book, let's go back to Dracula here as we started out, how has this book been received so far as far as feedback and response? I have had a lot of people who said, I didn't know that. I, if, you know, they, they get on the internet and they don't know this information, I, I, they, they go to this book for their historical facts, and I said, this is as best as I could, as everything that I could come up with, you know, you know, debunking the whole Michael Boheme, you know, uh, the poem by Mo Michael Boheme that, and some people try to, it, it's in, it's actually written in German, I believe it's in German, mm. and uh, now that I'm thinking about it, but a lot of people when they translate it, they can translate it into what they want, you know, mm -hmm. just to try to match with a vampire or go whatever subject they want to, and so that's why I had to get the Michael Boheme poem in there also, making facts about that. So. Okay. Well, I guess finally, if people want more information about you or your books, do yes. you have a place they can go? Oh, I have a MySpace page, I okay. have a Facebook page, I have a Twitter. It, my handle on, on Twitter is Twitter's, uh, Teresa's Escape, and I also have um, an author page on um, Filed By. If you Google Teresa L. Jones, um, well, the last I knew, uh, five okay. of mine come up <laughs> my okay. my space net. So. Well, I'm sorry we're out of time, <laughs> but thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much for having me come here. Fargo's really nice. Stay tuned for more. Minnesota State University Moorhead arts professor Brad Bachmeyer is a ceramic artist who makes beautiful and diverse pieces of arts. He uses a potter's wheel and the raku method of firing pots. Here's a profile of Brad's work. The clay I'm using here is actually a commercially prepared uh, clay that comes from Minnesota. I buy it from Minneapolis and uh, what I'm going to do first is I'm going to wedge it. And so I um, opened a business, bought a, bought a, a potter's wheel and, and uh, built a couple kilns and, and started doing just some local craft fairs and things. And uh, from there, you know, literally I, I never would have saw it coming, but for the last 17 years I've never been able to make enough work and, and keep up with demand from uh, galleries and, and places, outlets that I've been selling. And that will prepare it um, so that it's ready to be thrown into a vessel on the, on the wheel. The process that I use in firing is what probably sets my work apart from um, many other pot potters and makes it a little bit more rare, and that is a w one style that I'm well known for using is the ancient form of uh, raku, which is where you're firing pots to a red hot temperature around 2000 degrees, you're opening up the kiln, the pots are glowing red hot in there, and then you're pulling them out and immediately putting them in a, in a reduction chamber. The other method that I use largely is pit firing, which is a very primitive method that was used since the very beginning of time by people all over the globe, and that is simply you know, digging a hole in the ground and putting your pots in there and throwing whatever materials you've got, whether it's cow dung or whatever materials you've got you know, available at hand to burn, and those pots maybe get up not to 2,000, not quite 2,000 degrees, but um, hard enough, hot enough to fire those things and make them permanent. I'm going to begin by opening a hole in the center, and so I'm taking my thumbs and pressing a hole in. So when I ask this clay to stretch, it's going to stretch a long ways and hold itself out all the way out here. Um, it takes a certain degree of, I suppose, control, and, um, and it is a little bit more difficult method of throwing plates and platters, but again, it, it results in a nice, elegant foot, a nice a uh, light profile holding the needle tool still and I'm going to cut off a little bit of that rim 
just to ensure that it's nice and symmetrical all the way around. You know, I can take this, supporting it from underneath a little bit, and press down. And in one pass around the outside, create a nice, um, a nice even layer of marks. This piece is pulled out of the kiln at about 1200 degrees and you actually lay strands of horse hair on it. They sizzle and burn into the surface, carbonize into the, into the surface and leave nice fine black marks. I also lay some baling twine across there and that creates larger areas of smoke patterns. I think people are amazed when you say you're going into art or that you sell pottery and they assume that, well, who in the Midwest would buy it or that people around here you know, wouldn't appreciate it and, and it's quite the opposite. Um, again, over 17 years, I've just never been able to make enough. It's not been the problem of selling it. It's, it's, and it's not because it's more tremendous work than anyone else's. I think people underestimate um, the sophistication of people around here and, and recognizing and collecting pieces. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching.